Hello everybody, I'm, my name is Dr. Reshma, I'm an oral pathologist. Today we'll be discussing about odontogenic cyst. Now, what's a cyst basically? It's a pathological cavity which is not formed by the accumulation of the pus. And as we all know, if something gets accumulated with the pus, it's called an abscess. So similarly, this is a pathological cavity which is not formed by the accumulation of the pus. It may or may not be lined by an epithelium. This definition was given by Kramer in 1974. So all the cysts may not be lined by epithelium. So the cysts, if they are lined by the epithelium, are termed as true cysts. And if they are not lined by the epithelium, they are termed as the pseudocyst. So as you can see in the next slide. Now, what are the odontogenic cysts? These are the cysts which are actually arising from the tissues which form the tooth. So, or the odontogenic apparatus, we call them as odontogenic apparatus. So, if we remember tooth development and observe that, we know that this is the epithelial lining, overlying epithelial lining and with the, with the projection of dental lamina which extends down, the tooth bud actually starts to form. We remember this, we have learnt it in uh, DADH classes during tooth development. So, this is termed as the dental lamina. This is the overlying epithelium. Okay, and this is the tooth apparatus. So, in this, we have the epithelial components and we have the connective tissue components. If you remember, this is dental follicle, th this is dental papilla and the one which surrounds that is the dental sac and this is the epithelial lining. We have the inner epithelial lining, the stellate reticulum and the outer epithelial lining in and in between stellate reticulum and inner epithelial lining we have the stratum intermedium. Now, what are these odontogenic cysts? These are the cysts which arise from the apparatus which form the tooth. So basically they arise from the epithelium part of the tooth tooth forming tooth. Now, when we say reduced enamel epithelium, it's the epithelium. Once the tooth has been completely formed, we know that the inner and the outer enamel epithelium fuse together and they form a protective lining, a protective covering around the newly formed tooth. So, the cysts which arise from this reduced enamel epithelium uh, are, are the ones which are termed as dentigerous cyst. And then we have the overlying basal layer of cells which actually give rise to the dental lamina. So, this is also been prefixed and been told to form odontogenic uh, apparatus. That's why the cyst can also arise from the basal layer of oral epithelium which is been designated to form a, a tooth apparatus. Now, what are the cell rests of molasses? We know that the development of root happens by the downward extension of inner and outer enamel epithelium, which is termed as Hertwig's epithelial root sheets. The remnants of this Hertwig's epithelial root sheets are termed as cell rests of molasses. This can arise from these uh, cell rests also. Now, what are cell rests of dental lamina termed as cell rests of serrae? Now, the dental lamina breaks out into fragments once the tooth is being completely formed. So, its remnants normally are found in the gingival tissues or very close to in the periodontal ligament space. So, these the cysts of the odontogenic space do arise even from the dental lamina. So, now uh, why do we term them as odontogenic? They may be located anywhere in the jaw and we know that the origin of such cysts is because of the some impairment in the during the development of the tooth or the over activities of the cells which are supposed to rest in the gingival and the periodontal ligament space. So let us revise this. We know that the cysts arise from the reduced enamel epithelium, basal layer of the overlying epithelium, the cell rests of molasses and cell rests of serrae termed as the rest which are nothing but the rest cell rests of dental lamina. Now, what are the basic elements we have in the cyst? We will have a central lumen. Now, this lumen may be as, as it was explained in the, as it was told in the definition of the cyst, this lumen may be filled with a gaseous substance. It may be filled with a fluid, semi-fluid substances. So, based on the content of the lumen and the type of the lining which lines the lumen. So, this is the lumen and the lumen would normally lined by a 
epithelial layer. It may or may not be lined by an epithelial layer. So the lining, the contents of the lumen and the few components of the connective tissue which supports the epithelial lining determines the type of the cyst which, which we are looking into. Now what is a pseudocyst? And the pseudocyst will actually have a lumen. It will not have any epithelial lining. What actually surrounds the lumen is just the connective tissue wall. So they don't have a lining. Okay, this is the true cyst. If we observe very closely, there is a lining, epithelial layer, which is stratified squamous epithelial layer, okay, which is resting on a basement membrane here. And below that is the connective tissue. So we, the com we see the components of the cysts here. This is the lumen, which will have fluid, semi-fluid or gaseous substance, the epithelial lining and the connective tissue wall, which surrounds then supports the epithelial layer. Now, in case of a pseudocyst, it is just around, it, we have a lumen which is here in this case, it's filled with a lot of blood and we have the connective tissue wall, but we don't find any epithelial lining. So they are termed as the pseudocysts. Now, why is this so important? It's because most of the cysts we encounter are actually named according to the contents which are present in the lumen, the type of the epithelium which is there and the connective tissue component which is supporting the epithelial lining. So we'll go ahead and learn the classification of cysts. The classifications of cysts of head and, head and neck as given by Mervyn Shear has been divided into the cysts which are present in the jaws. That means the cysts which you encounter only in the jaw region, maxilla or mandible and the cysts which you encounter in the maxillary sinus region and the or the antrum region and the cysts which are lying in the soft tissues of the head and neck region. So they have been grouped so. Coming, let us go to the cysts of the jaws. The cysts of the jaws, again, we divide them into the epithelial line cysts, epithelial line cysts, and which are termed as the true cysts, and non-epithelial line cysts, which are termed as the pseudocysts. And then developmental, under epithelial lining, it is developmental, that means we know that these cysts are actually arising from the apparatus of the tooth development. So all the components which would have in turn given rise to the tooth development have undergone some uh, some anomaly or some uh, variation in their presentation patterns which gives rise to the develop these developmental cysts and then it can be inflammatory inflammatory meaning that they have arisen out of some infection or some inciting agent which has led to inflammation in the uh, jaw region leading giving rise to these inflammatory cysts and then again developmental can be odontogenic that means we know they are arising from the odontogenic uh, apparatus non-odontogenic that means to say these cysts are also found in the jaw but the origin or the etiology of such cysts is not because of the two developing apparatus it is different normally the non-odontogenic cysts arise at the line of the fusion of two embryonic processes we know that uh, when we study development we know that the uh, the palatal two palatal halves are fused are fused together by the horizontal plate of the palate so the line of the fusion of two horizontal plates what happens is the, it is all covered by epithelium. So they have to degenerate before the two processes the embryonic processes fuse. If these two processes if the epithelium, epithelium of these two processes doesn't degenerate what happens the epithelial cells persist in that line of fusion and they may in due to some inciting agent they uh, they proliferate and then give rise to non odontogenic cysts so this cysts are the cysts which basically arise because of the epithelium which gets entrapped at the line of fusion of two embryonic processes now uh, what normally we encounter are the odontogenic cysts and uh, among the odontogenic cysts, we are, again, the names which have been put up. Now coming to the epithelial line cysts which are arising from the odontogenic and are developmental. That means because of some defect during the development of tooth, these cysts have arisen. So these include gingival cysts of the adults, gingival cysts of the infants, gingival cysts of the adults, developmental lateral periodontal cysts, Botroid odontogenic cysts. Now, botroid odontogenic cysts and developmental lateral periodontal cysts are related. That means this is just the unilocular variant, and whereas the botroid odontogenic cyst is a multilocular variant of lateral periodontal cyst. Next comes the odontogenic keratosis, the dentigerous cyst, eruption cyst. Now, dentigerous cyst and eruption cyst again are related. If we know both of them arise around the crown of a developing tooth or an impacted tooth. 
but an dentigerous cyst is seen within the bones, within the cortical plates or the medulla of the bone, whereas the eruption cyst is seen within the, uh, in the soft tissue. That is, it is found in the gingival tissue uh, and it is a soft tissue cyst. Okay, next comes glandular odontogenic cyst and calcifying odontogenic cyst. These are important. Candular odontogenic cyst is really rare to occur, but when it occurs, it occurs in the maxillary region, in the maxilla most commonly, whereas calcifying odontogenic cyst is also common in the maxillary anterior region. Now, what is the unique feature of this glandular odontogenic cyst? It may be confused with some of the salivary gland tumors or cysts. Okay, next what is what is the unique feature is that this cyst is actually lined by mucus cells. There is presence of mucus secretion and because it is very similar to a salivary gland, it has been named as glandular odontogenic cyst. We will discuss in detail about the other cysts now. Coming to non-odontogenic cysts, as it was told previously, they are nothing but the cysts which arise or because of the epithelial cells which get few which remain at the site of fusion of two embryonic processes uh, one is as i told you one is because uh, of the fusion of the palate the epithelial remnants over there which is called as mid palatile raphe cysts of the infants next is nasopalatine duct cysts so the, the remnants of the duct if they persist and they develop if they get some uh, proliferation capacity and they continue to proliferate, they give rise to the cyst, which is the nasopalatine duct cyst. Next, we have the nasolabial cyst. Now, if the nasopalatine duct cyst is a heart tissue cyst, that means it is it, it is present within the bone. The nasolabial cyst is present is a soft tissue cyst. It is seen on the lateral part of the nose, and it is a soft tissue cyst normally seen. Again we know then we have a non-epithelial line cyst which are the solitary bone cyst and aneurysmal bone cyst. Will be, uh, what is exactly a solitary bone cyst? A solitary bone cyst is something which is caused because both of the cysts are caused because of trauma. Where in case of a, what happens normally when we see and observe whenever there is a cyst formation because of a trauma, trauma actually leads to fracture within the bone. Now this fracture has to be filled with blood and when this gets filled with the blood, it slowly organizes itself and forms new bone in that region. That is the normal healing process which happens. But in case of a solitary bone cyst or aneurysmal bone cyst, there is a defect. This process does not continue. In case of aneurysmal bone cyst, what happens is that the hematoma which is being formed in that region will have continuous supply of blood. And what happens, uh, we'll, we'll have a continuous supply of blood and fresh blood is always filled up and this, there is, uh, this doesn't allow new, uh, hem new hematoma to be formed and also allow the hematoma to get organized. So what happens, this persists there as a blood filled space and this is just not lined by the cavity. Ca the cavity of this wa wall is not lined by epithelium and hence it's a pseudocysts. Pseudocyst. When coming to a solitary bone cyst, the same phenomenon happens. That means there is trauma in that region uh, and there is blood pooling up there, it is a, but, but there is no continuous supply of blood to that particular cystic space. So what happens? Whatever hematoma which is being formed, instead of getting organized, it gets degenerated. And so what we find in the cystic space is either gaseous material or some necrotic remnants which will be found. So that's the basic difference between solitary bone cyst and aneurysmal bone cyst. Now one more thing to be added for aneurysmal bone cyst is that this cyst is of two types primary and secondary. The primary as I told you the main reason, reason for this is because of trauma and the impaired hemodynamics. That's why the blood is still there and it's not getting or the hematoma which gets formed doesn't get organized. Whereas another condition which is termed as secondary, it happens because of, it happens same because of uh, blood vessels where, where there is impairment in the blood vessels, but these happens in the tumors which have been pre-existing. So what happens in the connective tissue of these tumors, the blood vessels are not organized and they get impaired because of which the 
the it results in an unresumable bone cyst so in both the conditions they are not lined by epithelium and hence termed as non epithelial lined cyst and these are non odontogenic coming to the cysts which are of inflammatory origin we know all of this which is radicular cyst residual cyst paradental or juvenile paradental cyst and inflammatory collateral cyst now uh, we will be discussing radicular cyst and residual cyst coming to paradental or juvenile paradental cyst now these cyst are again inflammatory but these arise most commonly in the uh, in, around the third molar region where we have the impacted tooth now normally it's not that uh, impacted teeth normally can give rise to only dentigerous cyst if they are partially erupted into the oral cavity they are exposed to the oral fluids so what happens there is a cyst develop develop because of the inflammation of the uh, of the periodontal ligament space so and it actually gives rise to a paradental cyst which is found in association with the partially erupted teeth most commonly the third molar teeth so that's a paradental cyst 